Tonight, I'm going to be talking a little bit about our Duke Hospital parking lot pocket prairie, which is a fun little alliteration, and I hope you enjoy uh, tonight's program. And so if you don't mind waiting until the end to ask questions or putting things in the chat, I think Ken's going to be moderating, um, and then we'll get to those at the end. So sort of the... Oop, no, too far. Uh, sort of the overview of what I'll be talking about this evening. So I'm going to go from kind of large scale down. Uh, so initially, I just want to talk a little bit about prairies, what they are from an ecological perspective, and then talk a little bit about Piedmont prairies. Uh, as a native plant society in the Piedmont of North Carolina, I imagine you probably, a lot of you are familiar with the concept, um, but I'll be talking about that a little bit more. Uh, and then including the one that we have created within the confines of the Bloomquist Garden. And then I'll talk a little bit about pocket prairies. And then the meat of the program is the parking lot pocket prairie that we created um, here on the Duke campus near the hospital. So for those of you who have not been here, let me introduce you to Duke Gardens. We are a 55 acre botanic garden right in the center of the campus in Durham. And we have about five, well, I would say four sort of curatorial um, areas and they are represented um, here. This is um, the Red Bridge in the uh, Culbertson Asiatic Arboretum. And then this is the Charlotte Brody Discovery Garden. And in that garden, um, we have kind of a nice mix of um, both sort of like vegetable and farm kind of crop plants, as well as um, perennials and uh, annuals, and which is they're trying to kind of do a mix sort of display. Uh, in the center is our historic garden, which is our more kind of formal garden. And that was the original section that was um, created back in the 1930s. And then up in the corner here, this is the gatehouse of, um, this is our an original entrance to the Bloomquist Garden of Southeastern Native Plants. And then these are just some kids enjoying themselves out and about. So to talk a little bit more about the Bloomquist specifically, um, it's the second oldest garden in Duke Gardens proper, and it's named in honor of um, Hugo Bloomquist, who was the original botany professor at Duke. Uh, he was a early kind of conservationist, and he did a lot of work with um, things like ferns and trilliums and um, the hexastylus and serum, uh, the gingers. So that's, um, that's a little bit about us. We are kind of main foci, we kind of say that we've got three sort of focus areas and that is um, conservation, collections, and then ornamental displays. So that's who I am and where I am in this garden. Um, and then now about prairies. So what exactly is a prairie? So it's a landscape, as you might imagine, that's dominated by um, grasses and flowering perennials, but with very few trees. Uh, there are different types of prairies depending on where you are uh, on the planet, but they generally are moderate rainfall areas with uh, very few trees. They can be moderate in temperature or they can be fairly extreme. Um, the prairies that outside of the Piedmont prairies uh, that we are probably as a, uh, as a country most familiar with is those in the Great Plains. And, and what was the causation effect of the Great Plains was the uplift of the Rocky Mountains. And that created a bit of a rain shadow through the central part of the state uh, of the country. Um, so despite low rainfall, uh, prairies often tend to be very fertile and many uh, have been transferred into uh, either rangeland or agricultural uses. In fact, 99% of the tall grass prairies and 75% of short grass prairies in the United States have been transferred to agricultural usage. So what's so great about grass? Um, why are grass systems even a thing if succession in an ecological perspective tends to favor trees? Um, so one thing is that grass tends to be more effective um, photosynthetically. They have a different pathway that I'm not going to really talk about, but it uh, tends to be more, mm, 
just more effective. Um, they also have a lot of large biomass in terms of huge intertwined root mass that creates sort of mats and that go kind of far out um, into out from the center and then down into the soil and can dig deep to uh, get water and nutrients. And uh, it also reduces soil erosion. So they kind of stay uh, in place and other plants are, have a harder time kind of creeping in into them. Um, and as the roots die, they tend to keep their, um, their nutrients in, in place. So like if you think of when a tree dies, it falls in the forest and then it has to go through this big process of decomposition before those nutrients go back into the soil. With grasses, it's, it's, a, it's not as um, intensive a process because you don't have to break down all of that woody material. Um, and another thing that's interesting about grass um, is that um, and as I talk more about some of the ecological drivers of, of these systems, um, grass has its growing portion at the base of the blade. So grazing doesn't kill it where like buffalo or um, cows can, can eat them and they don't, um, they don't perish. Whereas woody material, um, it, it can often does kill the plant. Uh, and in fact, once plant um, grasses have been grazed, they tend to actually hyper, um, hypercharge their photosynthesis. So, I mean, we obviously know this from having lawns and, and, and how grass comes back once you uh, mow it probably sooner than you would even like, um, I would suspect. Uh, and then lastly, grasses have evolved um, both cool season and warm season varieties. So that sort of um, heightens their uh, effectiveness as a group as well. Um, and so some of the ecological roles of prairies, um, they provide habitat for wildlife that may live nowhere else. Um, they also in moderate or wetter prairies can act as filters for water filtration water passing through the soil and um, recharging water tables. And then biodiverse, because they're so sunny, uh, biodiverse plant herbaceous species can be more common. So there just tend to be more biodiverse um, areas. And some of the drivers of these prairies are bison, uh, as, I, as I have depicted here. Um, and this, um, this is true of Piedmont prairies historically as well as um, the uh, tall grass um, and short grass prairies of the, the central part of the country. So the hooves act as sort of till tillers to aerate the soil, which reduces the compaction of the soil and create air and water spaces within the soil, um, adding soil fertility through uh, manure and then removal of plant material, um, woody plant material that can't regenerate, like I had mentioned just a moment ago, the way that the grasses can. And then a second very important driver of prairies is fire, uh, which also removes woody material um, that are that may not be adapted to fire. And then fire puts nutrients directly back into the soil again. And so this is a little kind of cautionary tale, uh, the Dust Bowl, aka what happens when we abuse our prairies. So uh, to give a little bit of historical context, um, this is sort of where the, the bulk of the Dust Bowl happened back in the 20s and 30s. So in 1862, Abraham Lincoln enacted the Homestead Act that allowed uh, settlers to be entitled to 160, up to 160 acres of unsettled land in the center of the country, which brought scores and scores of people into that area. And um, in short order, a lot of that land uh, was converted into agriculture. A perfect storm of drought conditions and high winds in the uh, late 20s and, and 30s um, caused a catastrophic ecological crisis that kind of happened on the heels of the Great Depression and the, um, the stock market crash of uh, 1928, making it increasingly unlikely for people to find um, income elsewhere. And so areas that were getting depleted um, were then being torn up um, 
continually um, for agriculture, which then added more and more um, dust and wind and so on and so forth. And you didn't have regular rain events return into the region until the 19, uh, 1939. But by then the economic and ecological disaster um, had been done. Millions of acres of topsoil had been lost. Um, and as we know, most of the land in the center of the country is retained um, in agriculture to this day. So getting a little bit closer to home, we'll talk about the Piedmont Prairie. Um, so historically much of the Piedmont as we know it today was actually um, some grassland, believe it or not. Um, much of the Eastern US was dotted with prairies of various sizes. Some of the plant species that were seen in the Great Plains could also be seen uh, occurring in the Piedmont prairies, but some species unique to this area uh, also evolved. And here's some examples of some recreated Piedmont prairies um, in, in the state, and I think in Georgia as well. If you excuse me, I'll have a little sip of water. Oops. Uh, so European explorers back in the um, 16th and through the 18th centuries documented large swathes, swaths of uh, prairie land. As you can see in this picture, Right here, this is the coast of, I think, South Carolina. Um, I think right maybe under here you can see a port of Charles. So, and then you look over here, it's the Savannah land. So a bunch of this area was actually a uh, grassland. So like other prairies in North America, the Piedmont Prairie ecosystem was held in balance by the presence of large herbivores and natural fires. We actually did have bison and elk in this area. The Southeast also has the largest incidence of lightning strikes. Europeans also documented um, the indigenous practice of starting fires to reduce competition from trees and shrub species. And the young green shoots that would come out after the fires would be attractive to uh, bison and elk, which would then um, start that cycle again of uh, tilling and, and um, fertilizing from the bison elk, but it was also directly important to the maintenance um, of the prairie and the livelihood of Native Americans. So what happened? Um, much of that land shifted to agriculture here as it did elsewhere. Uh, as people moved to cities or abandoned to, I'm sorry, moved to cities or abandoned the farms um, without those the large game um, and fire, because obviously fire suppression is, is um, something that is common in our society um, for good or ill, understandably. Um, the former prairie became forested lands. And so what sort of this remains of the Piedmont Prairie can be seen really in uh, roadsides and power line right of ways anywhere that it, it remains sunny or uh, maintenance regimes like mowing keep woody plants from dominating. So that's sort of where the Piedmont Prairie resides generally today. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the Piedmont Prairie that was created in the Bloomquist Garden. So this is a little bit before my time. I came to the gardens in um, early 2019. So as part of the conservation arm that I mentioned before, um, this project was started in 2015. Um, so currently in the garden, it is Annabelle Rennick is the curator. I'm the horticulturist. Um, at this time, Stefan Bloodworth was the curator and Annabelle was in my role. And so they, they took a piece of, um, the garden that was kind of unused, it was just sort of a, a pine land area and they removed all of the trees and they, um, it's roughly about an acre of land that the um, Bloomquist uh, Prairie covers currently. Um, the plants were harvested by seed for the garden um, from those sorts of right away areas that I mentioned before or um, along roadsides in the countryside in about, the, I don't know that they traversed any farther than Durham or Orange County. So all of the seeds are, are uh, kind of ecotypes to this area. So they chose about 110 different uh, species. 10 of those are grasses, but 
of that 60% to 70% of the biomass that was planted is a grass species. And um, I have a list, if you're interested for all 110 plants, if you'd like to get that list, uh, I think I can give that to you. I can, um, I'm happy to email it to you if you are interested. Um, so it was actually burned once in 2018 um, but generally what we do is to create a sort of dis disturbance regime uh, it, uh, to mimic bison grazing, for instance. We actually get a bush hog and cut it down uh, in late winter, early spring. However, we are kind of considering the idea of um, doing sort of an experiment where we cut it down also in the growing season to see how that sort of changes things um, as well as we may actually rent some goats at some point to see if we can sort of try to um, create on a smaller scale some of the sort of disturbance that you would have with bison but we'll can use goats instead. So one thing that has been kind of a challenge is because it is a dynamic system and and Oftentimes you get some species that tend to dominate. Um, the biodiversity has sort of reduced a bit. So we would like to see if we can change some of our um, maintenance regimes to see if we can bring back a little bit of the biodiversity. But it is still um, a lovely place and we're very proud of it. And here are some pictures of some of the blooms that grow in the gardens. Uh, we also started in 2019 an insect uh, project to determine the level of the pollinators that we have in the garden. So we use malaise tents. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those. So they're basically kind of, they look like, I don't know if how you, they're basically just tents that the insects um, get caught into and then they crawl upwards, it's sort of like, um, I don't know, about four feet tall, I would say. And they crawl up to a little container um, when they're trying to get out of the netting. And in that container is alcohol and, and they perish, of course. And that allows us to kind of determine both biomass and type of insect. So that's kind of an ongoing project where we're looking at um, what sort of pollinators we have in our garden versus ones um, in some of the other um, curatorial areas that I mentioned earlier. So we've got some promising results that um, the Discovery Garden that I mentioned earlier that is kind of a combination of um, kind of a little bit of a vegetable garden and um, so on and so forth. Um, they actually are really high in pollinators as well. So plant it and they will come, I guess. So now to talk about pocket prairies or pocket meadows. Um, so taking many of the plants that you would see in prairies or meadows and putting them into home beds essentially or larger areas um, can be something as small as like a home garden like you'd see here up to uh, underused urban spaces um, to encourage wildlife or pollinators. Here's a few examples of those that I found in a um, design magazine that I thought were particularly pretty. So, I mean, it kind of runs the gamut. Some are a little bit more bloom heavy and then these ones are a little bit more grass heavy, but uh, it's a nice alternative to your, you know, bluegrass lawn, for instance. One thing that I have thought was interesting um, is that a lot of the plants that we have in our um, prairie, maybe not the exact same species, but some of them are actually being utilized in these like high end uh, British gardens. So this is a cover of Gardens Illustrated, which is a glossy, fancy British um, horticultural magazine. And this little meadow that was created is on some like a state for some you know landed gentry person and and but you can see right here that you've got like this prairie dock with you know silphium terebinthacum got leotris not a lot of grasses but it is kind of cool to just see that um there that is kind of a trend that is is happening worldwide uh, i also 
on the left here, what this indicates is I looked at the Royal Horticultural uh, Society's list of plants. You can go onto their website and you can essentially put in a genus and it will list the number of species or cultivars that are available for that particular plant. So for instance, have there are 78 um, Heliopsis, either species or cultivars, and it goes all the way down to Helianthus, the sunflowers, they have 904 uh, either species, straight species or uh, cultivars that are in use in, um, in the horticultural trade. So that was kind of interesting to me. And this I thought was a fun little uh, article that I read about a guy in Chicago who, as soon as he, uh, he said he, as soon as he was, he bought himself a house, he was going to take out the lawn. So, and put in a little uh, pocket prairie. So this is in kind of a walkable or a walk up brownstone neighborhood. Um, and he said that he has, was surprised that there still is a fair amount of maintenance required for it, but it's while no one else in the uh, neighborhood has adopted this particular method, um, he does have a lot of people that are interested in it and bring people over, you know, kids to come and look at it. And obviously the pollinator levels are off the charts comparative to the neighbors uh, in that, in that uh, neighborhood. So hopefully more folks like him will kind of lead the charge with, changing their lawns into pocket prairies. <clears throat> Again, you can see some of the like echinacea and um, rudbeckia and some of those sorts of plants as well as grasses. Um, and then moving on to kind of talking about um, utilizing prairies in urban spaces. I'm sure everyone is familiar with like the High Line in New York. Um, these are some examples that I saw in um, a, a article in, I think these two are in, the ones on the right side are in Ohio and the one in the middle is um, in Texas. So again, this sort of movement towards prairieizing or meadow plantings is, is well underway. And it could be kind of due to a changing aesthetic away from, you know, highly, um, <laughs> the word that came to mind was processed. <laughs> Uh, horticulture, but I, I think you follow what I mean. Um, and also perceived benefits uh, to using meadows in these sort of derelict spaces that are not otherwise being used or, in, or to just sort of green up a city, um, stormwater mitigation, so on and so forth. But, and again, it sort of runs the gamut between the one in the middle that is very kind of designed. Um, and then the one on the right that's more grass oriented. So it's, I think it's a, it's a, a changing um, sort of movement in landscape architecture. And so now talking about what we have done uh, to give sort of a larger context. Um, now we'll talk about what we did at the, at the parking lot uh, at the H lot. So we started in 2019 with um, Annabelle, the curator, thought she wanted to see if, um, you know, with this sort of like changing uh, of the guard uh, horticulturally in urban spaces, could we on Duke's campus utilize sort of an unused space to plant some of these prairie plants to reduce um, the facilities inputs for uh, having to mow. They were also adding pollinators, of course. And then we also wanted to get a sense of whether or not people kind of got the idea um, what we were going for. So the first set that we did, we kind of subdivided into three sections and we wanted to do specific design types to see kind of how they would be translated um, and utilizing the same plants. And so you can see below, um, the list of the plants that we used. So all of the plants that we got were propagated in-house. They were either from local ecotypes that were collected uh, along with the ones that were collected for the prairie, or we purchased them from um, 
a niche gardens with or niche gardens, which was a native plant nursery that uh, has unfortunately gone out of business. And then um, this is generations after, you know, uh, propagated from those original plants that we got from niche gardens, if that makes sense, or Hoffman nursery. They are um, our grass. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Hoffman, but um, they produce a lot of um, grasses, sedges, and rushes, and they are uh, great friends of us. And, and in fact, helped, um, they donated some grass for us for this purpose specifically um, to kind of see how they would work. But uh, you can see a lot of um, penstemon, uh, pycnanthemum, anithera, so a good amount of uh, flowering plants. So what we did is, so this is a 90 uh, foot by 10 foot section that um, we, we didn't solarize it, unfortunately. Um, this was sprayed with Roundup, but um, thus is life. Sometimes uh, that sort of thing is required. Um, so we got, once some of the crabgrass was dead, we got a, um, not a dethatcher, but a sod cutter to remove the top layer of soil. Um, we did not amend it in any way. The soil was fair, like a bit compact, but it was actually surprisingly um, free draining. So it was pretty good soil to put these plants in. Um, and then, so we took that plot and then subdivided it into three for those different planting designs, as I mentioned. And so this is us in the process of actually kind of placing them out. We used a handheld uh, gas powered auger to drill the holes um, and then sort of laid them out on a sort of grid pattern that we created. And that's me right there. And that's, um, that's Annabelle. And then of course we roped off this area uh, to try to keep people from backing into um, the space while we were working. This is um, my colleague, Isaac, and, and this is a gentleman from the facilities department. I believe his name was Jose. And this is after we had finished up the planting, we watered one time um, just at the time of planting and then put down a, a fairly thin mulch layer. And here's kind of another view of those, of those um, plants. And here's the little stepping stones that we put in after afterwards, both to sort of, again, subdivide the different design um, types and then to give people who park on either side an ability to walk through. And then this is the happy crew after we did our day of planting. Um, that's Annabelle's son, um, Will. So he is not an employee, but he was a... Um, an extra hand that was sorely needed. So that was great to have him. And then, so this is what it looked like one year later. Um, quite attractive. We've got some um, Echinacea tensiensis. Um, I think this is maybe Saldego nemoralis. And then um, my personal favorite, as mentioned earlier, the uh, Asclepius. And this is what it looked like that first summer. And this is um, just one section and I'll kind of describe the, the sections of uh, design sections uh, in a moment. And this is what it looked like uh, a few months later in the fall, very attractive. I, I like the sort of muted tones personally, but I think they're both very, very pretty. So this is um, what I would call the wild section. So there was less sort of planning um, in terms of where the plants were gonna go. So I kind of strove for at least half grass being that it was supposed to be a prairie um, and then kind of put things in a little bit randomly. And I think it still, despite that looks, looks um, quite nice. And then this section is the one in the center and uh, Annabelle did this one. And the idea was to do the plants in sort of clumps. Um, so like a clump of solidago here and a clump of mountain mint here and um, to sort of see if that, what sort of effect that would have um, from a, you know, an aesthetic point. 
And then this is the formal section. And while it doesn't necessarily look like that, um, she put, this is, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Eric Rostis, it's supposed to be spectabilis. So the, it's a kind of a small mounding kind of purple love grass is what was supposed to be in the corners. But unfortunately, I think we got our seed mixed up and this is uh, a, a much bigger plant, Aragrostis um, hirsuta. But so that she did kind of um, plantings kind of on either side to be sort of more formalistic and um, uh, symmetrical. And so it, it that one, I think we were the least pleased with because I think, you know, these plants don't necessarily translate visually well within that kind of like formal sort of um, format. So here's kind of a view um, down from the more formal section, which didn't turn out so formal down. And then this is the same view otherwise. So as you can see, it was fairly densely planted and it did thicken up uh, fairly rapidly. And we did have a fair number of both blooms and grasses. So this picture is of that same plot two years later. And we both agree that the plants after two years are more robust. There's more blooms, more pollinators. Um, we're seeing, I mean, just scads of insects. I've even seen um, some goldfinches on the echinacea. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely doing what it's intended to. Um, so, and again, I, I should mention that in both of these instances, um, watering was done at the time of planting, maybe a month later, because we had a particularly dry October. And then the plants were cut down in February, weeded once, and that's it. It was, it was very kind of self-sufficient. And, and this is sort of how it's come out. This is what that section looked like um, in April of 2001. You can see these plants are very kind of robust as they're coming out. These smaller ones are the grasses. They come out later in the season, but you know, pretty hardy plants with very little oversight whatsoever. So we were very, very pleased with that. And this is what it looked like in July. Um, and this I think is sort of the middle clump section that I mentioned. So there was the wild section, the clump section and the formal section. This is the clump section in the middle. Um, she did more blooms to grasses. And then this is what it looked like in September. And I just think that's absolutely stunning. I love all the grasses and sort of gray tones. I think it's really, really pretty. So, and then we did a second plot that we started in 2002. So based on kind of what we learned from the first section, we thought it would be interesting to try both a different type of design so this time we did swathes and I will actually show you a picture um, of my, the drawing that I did so you can kind of see what I mean by swathes. But we also wanted to see how it, something like this could work for you know, homeowners that aren't necessarily going to go out and collect you know, local ecotypes from the side of their road. So we purchased all the plants in um, from North Creek Nursery and they're up in the Upper Midwest, I believe, or Hoffman again. Um, so again, none of these were um, propagated by us. They went completely like directly into the ground. The other thing too, is that we, in addition to some of the straight species that we purchased, we also got a couple of cultivars um, like the uh, Sympiotrichum October Skies and then uh, Huskers Red Penstemon. So we were kind of interested to see if any of the um, cultivars acted, you know, just how, how, how would they do in this particular um, really kind of torturous site where there was, you know, no, very little um, attention given to it. So how, how would they do? Um, so this is the plan that I drew out. And so you can see kind of from the next pictures that I show you, there's sort of a 
kind of a wave motion, um, not motion, but sort of shape to it. And it kind of worked and it kind of didn't, but you can kind of see how things are kind of in, in sort of wave shapes. And then there's some of the, the list of plants that I used. So this is when it was put in, in September of um, last year. And we used the same methodology that we did the first time. The difference being also that it was one similar design type. We didn't do the subdivisions of the three types. We did it all in a swathe, um, but everything else was the same. We used the auger, we watered once, we mulched lightly, and then we just kind of let it you know, do what it was gonna do for the winter time. And the result was not quite as good as we expected. So as you can kind of see here, there was some stuff that came up, some here. So this is Anithra fruticosa or the narrow leafed sunflower, uh, I'm sorry, um, evening primrose, um, a little bit of, um, seems early, but I think that we had some early plant, uh, a solidago that was coming out, but there's these large patches in the middle that just didn't do anything. Um, not really sure why initially. Um, it may be because of the, the size of the um, trays that we got in were small kind of plants. So for instance, that, um, aster that I mentioned, the October skies, it was in a 72 cell tray and we just sort of plopped them in. So they didn't really have a ton of root mass compared to some of the other plants that we had used the previous year. So they may just have crapped out because they just didn't have, um, they weren't big enough yet. So that that's one theory. Um, we planted a little bit later. Um, that might be another thing. And also because of the nature of the swathes, because they're in kind of large clumps of this type of plant and a large clump of this type of plant and a large clump of this type of plant, instead of being more interplanted, when there is problems or when there is a gap, it shows up more readily. And again, it's a whole 90 foot planting instead of just, um, you know, these smaller uh, subdivisions. So we thought, well, you know what, we should probably um, add some more of the plants that were left over from the previous year in um, the springtime. So we added some more stuff back in again. Um, another thing that we learned is that really the best time to plant grasses is at the beginning of their growing season. So these are um, warm season grasses. So they really kind of start their photosynthetic, photosynthetic life later than a lot of other plants do. Uh, so when we, and we noticed this too in the first segment back in 2019, that some of the grasses that we put in just didn't really perform well. And one of the suggestions was that maybe we, when we did our augering of the holes that perhaps they were planted a little bit too deep and that the, uh, that the crown was a little bit lower than it should have been. So that, so we were more cognizant about making sure that the crown was kind of right at the soil surface level. And then also um, doing them at the beginning of the season was suggested. And we found that in every instance where we planted them in the summertime instead of in the fall. So when they're ramping up, instead of when they're going, um, ramping down, it was really kind of, um, more successful. And then this is what it looks like now when I was able to get some of the grasses in and fill in some more of the plants. Um, it's not bad. <laughs> I don't think it looks quite as good as, uh, our initial, uh, plot, but again, it really took two years for the first section to really kind of come to come into its own. So it may be that this plant uh, section will be, will be better next year. Um, so, you know, here's hoping and, and to be determined.
So here is a couple of interesting points that we noticed that was kind of interesting between um, some of the plants from the first year, from the first section and the second. So uh, right here, for instance, is, um, where do I have it? Some mountain mint, um, pycnanthemum. We found that the species that we had, whether they were, I think that they were maybe roadside collected, they were a lot taller, um, fuller, whereas the one that we got from um, Prairie Nursery, um, I'm sorry, not Prairie Nursery, uh, the folks up in um, Wisconsin, I think they are, or the upper Midwest, they, they did really well, the ones that we purchased in in that second plot, but they were all, it was like a ground cover, it was prostrate. It just sort of went this way, whereas ours goes up and around, this one kind of goes kind of out and flat. I mean, and it was great because it filled in a lot of the holes. So it did really well in that swathe design, but um, it did not act the way um, our local ecotype did. So that was, that was interesting. Not really sure what that's about. Uh, similarly, this is the anithra I mentioned earlier, the evening primrose, which is one of our workhorses in the garden. We love this plant, love the like blue green kind of color to the foliage, a little goes a little bit red in the fall. And then in the spring, it has just these fantastic yellow flowers that um, we're both big fans of. So this one on the right is one of the ones that, that's, it's a, it's a individual that was planted in the original kind of, um, uh, segment doing great. The one that we got from out of town, if you will, same, it's a straight species. Again, it's not a cultivar of any sort. It just didn't do as well for us. It just kind of, kind of crapped out and we had to replant that one a couple of times. And then eventually I hate to say it, and this is no, um, dig on the quality of, of the plants that they produced. It was just that maybe, you know, the local ecotype just worked better in this particular punishing, full sun, no rain, people walking on it kind of um, situation. So that was um, interesting to note, just the sort of like, <coughs> excuse me, morphological differences between uh, the plants from the two different areas. So some of the problems I, I encountered, um, Again, I mentioned the first segment, we really had very little problems with weeds. We had some winter weeds, you know, your hen bits and whatnot, but we were able to kind of keep those under control by hand weeding that first winter. And then um, just by the plants that we put in, just becoming more and more robust, sort of out competing them. In the swathe section, the most recent segment, um, we had this purslane persistence that just would not quit it. I have spent way more time maintaining this new segment, trying to get this purslane out. And we're not sure where, if it came, where it came from, but um, it seems like it's just an unending battle. Um, as you can see here, here's a little segment of the root. You have to, all of these little shoots or new little plants that come out. So if you leave even one little segment of this when you're weeding, then a whole new crop comes out. So I would weed and weed and weed and you have everything out, but you'd have maybe one little section of, uh, of the purslane hanging out in and amongst, you know, your mountain mint and you don't see it. Next thing you know, it's like spread back out again and, and covering the ground. And so because we did have those empty patches, this was a nightmare. And it continues to be so. In fact, I had one of my volunteers getting some out today. So that one has definitely been a challenge. Another issue is that sometimes people are not polite to plants. Um, folks just kind of back up onto the plants. I, I don't know if they just don't realize how far their trucks go back or what, but um, and they're exhausted, like blowing on all the plants. <laughs> So that's kind of an unfortunate thing. People can be a little less than cognizant about the space around them when they're parking. You can see kind of down here, here's a, a combo shot of some guy parked 
well into uh, into the planting. And as a result, we did the second time, noting that people have a tendency to be thoughtless uh, in this way. We didn't start putting any of the plants in. I, we had a, I should say, a, a one foot sort of buffer area. And sometimes that was adequate and sometimes it wasn't. And then of course, when these cars are up over the area when you're trying to weed, you don't necessarily see them all and they kind of come down into the parking lot and it, it's, that's kind of, that's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, and then we have a good problem, um, which is we had a wonderful crop of um, monarchs chewing down all of our Asclepius. So that was, um, that is a good problem to have. So that, that, that was fun to see those. Um, and then back to grass, because it is a prairie after all, I just wanted to sort of do a shout out, highlight some of the grasses that um, really tickled me in the process of all of this. And again, uh, I'm not sponsored by Hoffman Nursery, but I do want to thank them for their uh, generosity in this and helping us out with this project. So on the left hand side, this is a Shizacrium uh, standing ovation. So it's a a little blue stem that, I mean, just those colors, just, oh, I love them so much. <laughs> so pretty, all of the sort of like reds and blues, and it's just very, very striking. And then on the right-hand side, this is um, Andropogon Black Mountain. So it's Andropogon tenarius, and it's a, um, I think they found this particular uh, variety in the Black Mountain area of North Carolina. And I, it's a little bit shorter, but um, you can't really see it in this picture. It is a little bit floppy, but they have the most beautiful silver flower heads. Um, I just, I just think they're they're really stunning and they look really great in the fall. I and mean, it's a really nice kind of once all the blooms are done, then you have the the grass show to look forward to. So say I. And last but not least, <laughs> this one um, is a species that I just found out about. Um, uh, Shannon from Hoffman uh, gave this. This is Aragrostis eliadii. And I am absolutely enamored with this plant. Um, I have, it's a little video, I don't know if it'll show, where it's just, this is them blowing in the wind. I just like the motion and movement is just fantastic. And it looked really, really great up against the Solidago. They may have been a little bit big for the narrowness of the, of the parking lot, but if planted in something that could be a little bit um, wider or deeper, I think this is absolutely stunning grass. Like, cannot speak high enough about it. So that's Aragrostis eliadii, and you can get it from Hoffman Nursery. Again, not sponsored by them, just a big fan. Um, and then, so we do want to continue doing these sort of experimental plots. Um, kind of the next section we were, we're thinking about is maybe trying to do sort of a more xeric uh, planting. Uh, or potentially sort of a Mediterranean look, maybe less prairie, but another one that's um, kind of a low intensive, low water kind of planting where we would maybe utilize some, some permatill, gravel. Uh, additionally, given the sort of conclusions and questions that have come up during this process, we're thinking about trying to do kind of like a trial garden maybe in that section. So uh, util again, going on the hunch about local ecotypes uh, eco versus ones that aren't, um, the cultivar or native R versus street species, um, planting time, whether or not if bigger roots is always, you know, gonna um, win out versus like can some smaller plants work out, you know, so whatever. So just sort of wanting to maybe um, look deeper into some of the things that we that we found, questions that came up. So these are sort of our conclusions um, and more questions that, that came up in the process of, of creating this space. So public interest versus public disinterest. So we were hoping that by putting this garden or this um, planting in that space that it would kind of you know, add some visibility to pollinator um, habitat in these sorts of 
otherwise quote unquote unused space and just sort of get a feel for what people thought. Um, one thing that we've considered is putting out some signs with QR codes where people can take surveys and just sort of say, hey, we like this, we don't like this. What's this plant? Why are these weeds here? Whatever, just kind of see what, what people think or just kind of even just put in like a mailbox when piece of paper and pencil and just sort of see, you know, what kind of comments we get. So that's, that's something that we plan on doing um, in the future, but it's also disheartening to kind of see the level, I guess, of disinterest maybe, or just not understanding what the space is, just seeing people as I'm weeding, just walking right across with no, um, just not, not being very disrespectful, finding trash in it. So that's, you know, um, so we have more work to do about bringing people on board with what we're doing. Um, we've also thought about maybe doing, kind of adding that insect study that we, I talked about in the Bloomquist garden on a smaller scale to the H lot, because we've certainly seen a lot of uh, insects and pollinators in that area. So we'd like to kind of see, you know, what sort of level are we looking at? Um, and then weeds are the worst, obviously. Uh, so we still need to kind of figure out what went wrong with that second plot. Is it just the space? It was just bad luck. Maybe the mulch happened to have some of that purslane in it. Not really sure. Um, and also thinking about if using the non-local ecotype plants that you can purchase, maybe we need to just keep a closer eye on them in general. Because as I said, we, we really didn't water them a whole lot. We just sort of put them in the ground, um, gave them some mulch, watered them once, and then just sort of let them be. Uh, and so maybe we need to keep a closer eye on them. So that's another thing we'd like to maybe look at with our trial. Um, and then again, still need to determine the best time for planting. Maybe if we had done that second segment earlier and, and allowed some of those smaller plants the ability to grow more of the roots, it would have worked out better or, you know, hard to say. So that's still a lot uh, of questions to be answered. And then sort of some based on what we have encountered, some suggestions for creating your own pocket prairie. Um, if you are uncomfortable with uh, getting rid of rid of weeds the chemical way, you might want to try solarizing. Um, so um, a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that concept. But for those of you who are not, it's a matter of basically sort of smothering uh, plants with like plastic or cardboard so that they they can't photosynthesize. So you but that's kind of a long term prospect. It's not something that you could do quickly. Uh, and I've, we've done some solarizing where we put out some black plastic and then several months later removed it and some of the plants were still able some of the stuff that you know this weeds that had seed in the in the seed bank were still able to come back so weeds are weeds are challenging as any gardener will tell you um in it all kind of depends on your own personal aesthetic but i kind of thought that based on what we saw a sort of a 50 50 mix of grasses to blooming plants really sort of looked the best um, but you could kind of go however you want. Um, more blooms probably mean more maintenance, however. And then I personally kind of thought that the more naturalistic design looked better than doing something kind of more formal or swathy, something that's really um, more horticultural. Uh, and then for best results, as I said before, maybe doing the grasses in late spring um, and then not doing any of the blooming plants too, too late in the fall. And then making sure that you've got good sized roots on your plants is always, is probably always good. As I'd mentioned before, the real small plants didn't do so well. Uh, I have a little link here that you could, uh, I, don't, I don't know if uh, Ken made mention about um, having uh, links um, on our video. I'm not sure how to do that, but maybe jot this down if you're interested uh, or if you want to watch this video again. Here's a link to an article about um, pocket prairies, and they kind of go um, into some of the different elements that I didn't necessarily go into. And then lastly, realize that uh, this is a dynamic 
kind of little mini ecosystem. So your annuals that you might plant, I mean, you're all native plant people, you know, this stuff, but <clears throat> your annuals that you plop in the ground, are just going to stay there and you take them out again, where this is, is really kind of a very dynamic sort of ecosystem that you're creating. So you got to be patient and just kind of keep being observant and um, hopefully you'll be able to come up with uh, a planting design and a selection of plants that um, work out for your space if you're so inclined to try doing a pocket prairie. And that's all I have for you this evening. Thank you so much for um, um, listening, watching. I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, we, <laughs> we actually have have had in the past a small population of deer living in the prairie, um, much to the chagrin of our colleagues because they <laughs> use the prairie as home base and then go out to do their browsing on all the delicious hostas and so on. In terms of the prairie plants themselves, honestly, not, not a ton. They love echinacea. So um, we have a a planting kind of near the prairie that has some uh, echinacea that they just constantly chomping on them, um, some uh, coreopsis as well. But maybe it's just due to just the sheer mass of plants. Um, but in again, I'm speaking specifically with Bloom Quist Prairie haven't really seen a lot of deleterious effect from deer on that specific other than that's where they live and so it allows them a home base to go elsewhere to destroy other plants. We have a program where all of the trees that are felled in the garden and on campus in general are brought to our compound and then they're ground down um, and then you know allowed to decompose a bit and then we we use that so okay. um but you could use different things as well if you wanted to but that's just what we use because that's what we had on hand Yeah, so the crabgrass, it still kind of comes back um, here and there. And then the area, because that whole median strip, I mean, we have plans for it, but part of it is still crabgrass. So it's kind of like sneaking back in a little bit. So, um, and then the in and amongst the plants, we get a little bit of, um, oh shoot, what's that called? Um, I can't think of it. It's a really common weed. Uh, I can't believe I'm not thinking of it. I'm blanking, but really kind of more on the edges where the cars have a tendency to back up right. is where we're seeing the more, the, the majority of the problems. So, but that being said, it, especially in the, in the first section, it, it really hasn't been that, that problematic a little bit along also along the edges of the little walkway paths areas, we'll get more crabgrass. So we do have to attend to that, but in, in the mix of the, of the, the plants themselves, we don't really have a lot of weeds popping up. Yeah, just, um, just kind of cutting it and then leaving it to rot in place because it is kind of fairly small. Um, it can be done pretty much by hand. Another thing that I uh, am remiss for not mentioning is that because it is a parking lot, we wanted to go for plants that were under like 36 inches. As much as the, I love them and they're a great plant, we, we had to stick with things that were short.